So, I'm sitting here today with Luthier Dave White, all the way from High Wycombe. Indeed. Thanks for joining me today, Dave. My pleasure. It's lovely to see you. Now, Dave here sent out one of his guitars recently to the Acoustic Soundboard Forum members. Mm -hmm. About a year ago you built that, is that right? Uh, I've lost track a bit now of how long it's been out there. I think it's, it's either late 2017, early 2018. It's been out. It's probably been about a year, yeah. And its name is its Anf name is An Anfaquil. Anfaquil. So I shall put that in the show notes so you can see how to spell <laughs> it. It's a beautiful guitar. I thoroughly enjoyed my custodianship of that instrument. Uh -huh. You tell us a bit about how you came up with the design. The history. Well, the history is that I all my guitars or instruments have to have names because they are people or things, beings that come yeah. alive and create music and I made my first baritone guitar and it was deep deep and rumming and having been a Tolkien freak when I was younger it had to be called Treebeard because of mm -hmm. that home home room don't be hasty <laughs> style of music so that that was Treebeard and then I got into harp guitar making and decided not many people have made uh, baritone harp guitars so I wondered what it'd be like to make one of those so I made one partly it's an experiment to how you get that lower string to actually work on an acoustic instrument because baritones are weird things because if you think about them the bottom five strings are pretty much in the range of a normal guitar because you're just taking the first string off yeah. so all you're doing is adding another low string on but it is very hard to get that low string to give an actual resonance one way of doing it is you put some very high tension over tension the middle gauge strings because basically when you get that roar from the mid-range your brain does weird things your brain hears it and it actually fills in parts that are missing and it fills in the notes that sit underneath it so you can actually get your brain to hear the low note but that's not good news long term structurally for the instrument but the other interesting way of doing it is to actually put a port like you do a ported speaker so putting a hollow arm on it actually helps that bottom end bass so it was an experiment in how to get a, a normal baritone to work but I was also interested in harp guitar so I put another four sub bass strings on it and that because it was older and deeper had to be called Fangorn which was the old name for Treebeard um, then Keith Chesterton who's here is a doyen of the uh, Acoustic Soundboard Forum said well oh take, take a step back from that I then decided that that was a bit big for me uh, personally I like something smaller and I was entering the territory of the slightly more highly strung instruments and a Turtz guitar which sort of originated in Germany in the late 1800s was a small guitar where it was tuned up three semitones so if you're playing in dadgad it will be in f to f yeah. intervals which sits nicely with a lot of Irish music with F whistles and stuff like that. Smaller, more compact. So I made a small Turtz harp guitar. Uh, and because it had to have the lineage back to Treebeard and Fangorn, it was called Fimbrothil, which was the lost end wife mm -hmm. of Fangorn that they all went missing and they had to go and try and find out where the end wives had gone. And then Keith, who I alluded to earlier, said, that's great guitar, but why don't you just make a Turtz guitar, take the hollow arm off and just make a Turtz guitar. So I did. Uh, and that had to have a lineage name and Tolkien in his book that he calls um, Fimbrothil is a name that means the slender beach and in Gaelic the nearest I get to that was Anfaquil yeah. Thea being Fagus <coughs> and the and uh, Quill being slender so she's Anfaquil but because no one can ever pronounce my name she's been known as Anthea from pretty early on in yeah. the tour which is fine yeah, that's how she was introduced to me <laughs> indeed she's a girl who <laughs> likes to get around <laughs> yeah. and she's a bit of a girl but no it's um the, the road trip idea I think is one that's underused by a lot of luthiers um I picked it up years ago from a lot of the luthier forums and guitar forums I was on in America there were a number of uh, people that did it you basically make a guitar you trust uh people to pass it round to and pass on and to look after it um, and the bit of that trust usually is based on the fact that it'll be centred around something like a forum where at least you've seen people that are yeah. on there yeah. there's a degree of trust in the rest of it 
uh, and you basically just send your instrument around. So it, it does two things. One is it gets your instrument out there and talked about, but equally it gives an awful lot of feedback from players, real players in real life situations. So um, there's lots of things that come back that people make comments about, oh, that would be better, this would be better, this was great, this wasn't, that actually help when you're making, that take you into that sort of feedback loop of what you're doing. And a lot of luthiers I spoke to about it seem to think of it as a risk because they think, you know, if I've got this £3,000 guitar and I'm going to send it around, why should it's a big risk? And I'm saying, well, it's not a £3,000 guitar until you've got someone that's going to pay you £3,000 for it. Okay. It's a guitar that you've got materials and put time into yeah. and it goes round. So if something goes wrong, you make another one. Yeah. And at least you've got it out there as a sort of commercial thing. But it's it's a slightly uh, open and naked process because you are then exposed to people making absolute comments about your beats going out there yeah. and early on in that process I, people said to me well I'll post and comment on it but do you want to edit what I put on there first and I said yeah it defeats the whole object the whole point mm -hmm. is it's meant to be open honest feedback that you tell me what you relate to so mm -hmm. if you're willing to go through that as a process I think it's usually rewarding as a maker because and the biggest plus you get is all this fabulous music that people create and the totally different styles you would never remotely expect certain yeah. of your instruments to do yeah. that people just play it and you think I would never in a million years have thought of playing that style of music on that right. sort of guitar yeah. but it works and it does. it's just great it's interesting because a lot of the I, I look at a lot of YouTube videos about audio gear and about camera gear and a lot of the big manufacturers send gear out mm -hmm. to YouTube reviewers for that, that same reason yeah. to get feedback on it. And well, you have to have the thing in your hands. Don't you? I mean, you, you can listen as much as you like to recordings and the rest of it, but until you physically have an instrument, you, you don't really relate to oh, it yeah. until you've got that, it. So, I mean, that's... That can creep up when, you, when you're custom ordering something, which obviously you've never played because it hasn't been built yet. Well, that's, that's no, the, to me, it's the relationship between a, a maker and a buyer or a, I don't want to call them customers because they're not your client or whatever. That That is quite a hallowed and holy trusting environment you're getting to first. Yes. And I, I hear this a lot of the time where people say, well, how do I know it's going to sound like this one you've made and the rest of it? And that's down to trust. Um, if you are shy of that, I say to everyone, just go and buy a guitar in the shop mm. that you've played. If that's your safety net but if you really can trust and the way I try and get people to trust is I probably won't make an instrument with someone unless they come and play the instruments I have because I can yeah. understand what they want and equally they have to play a range of my instruments to see it suits their style but if they do come because I've got loads of instruments in the music room right. uh, the house what hopefully it demonstrates is every single one of those has my sound every single one of those is a good instrument because if, if you're a luthier that's on top of your game knows your craft your next guitar is always going to be slightly better than the one you made before and yeah. maybe not much by increments you're on that top bit of the learning curve but yeah. if you've mastered your craft you know pretty much what they're going to turn out like it's convincing someone that wants to make a commission to do that but if you can get someone to sign that up it's win-win because they basically see the guitar born from the start they're in it, the whole mm -hmm. process of deciding which style which woods yeah. then they see the thing because I put a page on the website where it gets built and see it being built and yeah if you've got that trust at the end you know you're going to get the guitar you want yeah. out the other end of it so it, it, it's a trust trust but it's a hugely rewarding process if you do take that gamble and go down it but you must do your your homework first yeah. your due diligence research and, yeah. and go and play those instruments made by that that maker See, from a, a customer's point of view, one of the difficulties I find is finding a vocabulary that you can share with yeah, it's, your, your it's, it's like the fine wines, they mean different things to different <laughs> people, don't they? I think the, the vocabulary is to put the instrument in your hands and play it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's why gatherings like these are so valuable yeah. to you and to us as players, because we can, you saw the room downstairs, there's I don't know how many guitars. Lots. 60 I think there was a count last year, it was 80 something, yeah. I think. Ask, ask Paul. And he did a count. There's no bad guitars down there. Well, there is no bad guitar, is there? Because every guitar that's made, if you take the time and effort, you will find its perfect uh, owner. 
I mean, we we can make guitars over here with arrogance that we say uh, are cheap and don't sound well. But if you go to some of the poor, deprived countries where people are crying out to get anything to play and make music on, they all think it's a fantastic instrument. So in my view, it's a bit like Harry Harry Potter I'm into as well as Tolkien. It's like the wand and the magician. Every wand will be a match. Yes. You just got to find the match. The wand chooses the magician. Exactly, yeah. So, you know, when you get the wand in the hand or the guitar, I mean, most people that, yeah, I'm into guitars. We'll have that moment where they're just in a room or a shop or whatever, and all of a sudden, it will speak to you. You don't know yeah, why. I've had that happen to me. And the worst thing you can do is dither and walk away from it because when you come back, it'll probably be gone. There is a mystique and magic about that sort of thing. And yeah, you're absolutely right. That, yeah. That's what it's all. It, they, they are. Yeah, it sounds tr- yeah, weird and mystical and hippieish, but there, <laughs> there is something about because basically it's a box of wood with yeah. strings on it it's a drum with str- a neck and strings on it but there's something mystical about acoustic guitars in particular like wooden acoustic agree. guitars that is yeah. just amazing i like the way you've put that one of my guitars was the first guitar that i bought uh the first let's see high-end guitar that i bought is the one that i still have and i've had the longest and it was because of that very phenomenon and i played it once and is that your german the german one. Uh, yeah and i went home and I didn't buy it on the spot, oh. <laughs> and I it haunted me. Bad mistake. And a couple of months later, I got in touch. Luckily, he still had it. This was Heino Dreitz, yeah, yeah, from Germany. Because Bernd's got one of his as well, hasn't he? Yes. Because he sadly died, didn't he? He did. He year. died last year. Yeah, very young and tragic yeah. loss to the Luthier community. But yes, that phenomenon is. Well, he's, a wonderful his thing. baby lives on to make music as well, doesn't it? And you'll remember him every time you play it. So yeah, sure. there, there's that link that goes down, yeah. which I think, yeah. So tell me about the kind of woods that you like to build with. Oh, uh, what's my favourite tone wood? It's probably the one that's in my hand <laughs> at the moment in time of building. Because um, the more you work with wood as a luthier, the more you will understand what is going to make a good guitar. And it's surprising just how many different woods and woods that people would dismiss as being absolutely worthless tone woods mm. turn out to be workable tone woods. So I am happy to work with anything that I get my hands on that I can hear the promise in and I know what I'm going to do with it, if you see what I mean. So, yeah. well, the one you saw downstairs that I was the latest one I built came, it's got a Lawson Cypress top from the tree that was growing in my front garden for years until I had to have it cut down and then discovered what it was. And is that the same batch as Anfa Quill? Yes, same batch as Anfa Quill and others that have gone around. And it's got um, some spalted beech on the back and sides, which is wood that grows around me in the Chilterns where I come from, which is largely would be dismissed as a town wood and regarded as a furniture wood. Yeah. But it works beautifully. It felt good. It was a stable spalted set and it tapped really nicely. Yeah. Put it together and it works really well. So, you know, there's, um, I don't know how the history of the guitar making works because I think if you go back to the early Spanish tradition, basically luthiers like Torres and the rest, they were building with whatever wood they could afford and they were working hand to mouth because they didn't get paid huge sums of money to build it. Yeah. So a lot of their instruments were done with materials that worked in Spain, like the cypress that grew locally. So you get this myth of um, flamenco was built round cypress because that was the guitar that made sound it wasn't the cypress was the wood that was cheap right the okay. gypsies that used to live in the caves outside places like ronda and in seville and the rest of it couldn't afford more pricey guitars so basically they bought cypress and the gypsies made flamenco mm. duende and the rest of it came out of them the fact was they were using cypress back guitars to make music so it was the music on the instrument that became the flamenco whereas now we tend to look at it as a people who are making these things as luxury goods and yeah. of course you have to make it from the uh, Spanish Cypress otherwise it doesn't sound like a flamenco that's because that's how it developed yeah. and my understanding is that all the posh woods they came in on the back of the the horrible slave trade that the boats used to go out to the West Indies with the slaves on and then for yeah. ballast to bring them back they started filling it with all this wood that they were cutting down in the rosewoods and mahogany. The rosewoods in the uh, South America, northern bits of South America, yeah. and the Cuban mahoganies that was coming out of the uh, the Caribbean islands, Cuba in particular, yeah. but there's lots of them. That came back. The furniture makers saw it when it came back into London and uh, Paris or wherever it was coming into and said, I like that. And they started making flash bits of furniture. And guitar makers saw it as well, or yeah. instrument makers, yeah. because it was deemed posh. So, you know, this idea of the spruce Brazilian rosewood thing was not 
that was the Rolls Royce and where it came from. That was part of the serendipity. That was the wood that was coming back. That was the wood that was deemed to be posh and fashionable. Yeah. And it just happened to be a really good tone wood because it's got all the, the resonance and the overtones that you get from a good set of Brazilian. And that became, you know, this thing now, oh, it's got to be spruce yeah. rosewood or it's got to be spruce mahogany. That was just the way the fashion took it. If fashion had gone another way, you could have got all sorts of weird and wonderful tone woods that would be regarded as de rigueur yeah. for guitars. But you basically, if you keep an open mind, if you've made enough things and you've worked with wood, you'll pretty soon work out. And the obvious way to find out if it's a good tone wood is to make a guitar out of it and see what happens. That's fascinating. I know a lot of the UK builders are using local woods rather yeah. than some yeah. of the tropical woods. Well, that's a lot to do with the fact that the world's woken up to the fact this stuff is up getting actually uh, slaughtered yeah. out in the wild and decimated. So there's a lot more focus on uh, what's been happening in Brazil, in Madagascar and places like that. And yeah, yeah. a lot more of the world authorities like CITES and the rest have started to get more demanding about it and making it harder for the trade to carry on. So in some ways, I think there's a growing interest because there's this whole thing about uh, interest in nature and ecology and the rest of it is a driving force yeah. but there's also a necessity because it's getting harder and harder to legally get some of these other words to use that people are being forced in some ways to look in other areas but there's loads of stuff in fact the best if you go and talk to Colin later who the guy yeah. I tell you knows as he told us last night we've learnt Angie from Davy Graham and all the rest of it yeah he will tell you about the project at Leicester or Loughborough where they're making guitars out of uh, the fibre and the non-wood materials. And he says the best guitar he's ever played in terms of sound was one of the ones they made out of composite materials mm -hmm. because you can start applying science to those because every bit of composite material behaves exactly the same way as opposed yeah. to wood being an organic material that is going to be different every slice you cut. So you can use science to actually hone in and work out how acoustics work yeah. but he said it was great but it's not a guitar you'd ever want to own because it didn't have the duende the soul that you get from that yeah wooden doing it. so you know if if you run out of wood materials there are other materials you will make instruments out of but there are so many sustainable woods that you can make good guitars out of and if you have an ethos like i have that, that you do not waste any wood you can make an awful lot of guitars out of very little wood if you if you're very careful about what you do and you're not overly fussy about some of the stupid cosmetic hang-ups that a lot of people have yeah. about wood because some people when they look at wood that doesn't look what they think is perfect wood to them they lose all the characters wood, wood is an amazing material and wood with knots and all of the stuff in there that doesn't get in the way of the structure or the sound is the most wonderful looking stuff you could make. I mean, if people thought guitar should look like uh, the arts and craft type movement, you'd have a whole different set of guitars and ethos out there about what a, a guitar should look like. Yeah. So that, I don't think we'll run out of wood. Well, certainly not for small hand builders. Right. If people are taking forests down and selling guitars for stupid prices, which I've got a bit of a beef about you know I, it gets me into trouble sometimes when i have debates with guitar buyers because what happens i think is that a lot of the poorer countries basically haven't got any other choice but to exploit what resources they have forests are getting cleared out for other pressures such as they want to grow all the soya crops and the rest of it yeah. and they sell what i would regard as precious wood as though it was cheap as chips. So they'll cut down loads and loads of, say, Indian rosewood and the rest of it, and they'll sell it for something like about a pound a set or something. Yeah. And it just goes out and gets mass produced. And I, I just, you know, if I have to buy a set of wood like that, I've got to spend something like about 100 quid, 120 quid, and go and pick it out from someone that properly cuts it and the rest of it. And the economics are all wrong. If, yeah. if you can say that the price of that tree that's been growing there for 1800 years is a few pounds or whatever yeah. just been cut out of mass yeah. and it's problem of economic pricing the whole thing's just gone stupid it's top heavy like everything. yeah and it's not it's not guitar <clears throat> makers that are doing that it's, it's big furniture makers and the chinese yeah. demand and the new world demand of stuff i mean the, the guitar side of it is lost in the froth but unfortunately yeah. it gets tarred with that whole brush so you know my motto is you take take what you need and you use what you take and wood is precious so if you come in my workshop there'll be all sorts of boxes stuffed with bits that have been cut off 
20, 30 years ago or whatever, yeah. and then you'll suddenly take it out and you make it into part of a rosette or you put it on as a headplate and you find this and use it. And you can use all these bits that people say you just cut off and throw away, but if you store them, mm -hmm. and you can do multi tops on guitars, people seem to think that's a cheap option, but you can actually, if you haven't got um, quarter sawn wood all over a top, you, if you put pieces together of it, of quarter sawn pieces, you can actually get, uh, in some ways, a better top in terms of the wood structure. The right. glue join doesn't get in the way that much in terms okay. of doing it. So, you know, you can do multi-piece backs, you can do multi-piece tops. There's all sorts of stuff you can do that it, the problem is you've got to convince your buying customers that this isn't cheapening the product they're yeah. buying. It can actually make it better in a lot of cases. Fascinating. So, yeah. I know I listened to Bob Taylor talking about ecology and Ebony in particular, mm -hmm. he's got a program where yeah, yeah, I saw that. Planting, yeah, yeah, planting trees to and sponsoring and he's trying to get to them to accept them. the white white streaked ebony that they that used to have to reject because black was deemed to be. The, yeah. This is the thing about the perfection. People have this weird yeah. idea of what perfection is in wood. Is that you know wood wood does all sorts of weird things. You need to embrace it, not yeah. say, "Oh, that's freaky" because it's got a little white bit there. But yeah, yeah I think yeah, it's it's an interesting term because. To talk about sustainable wood is, is quite tricky because in the old days, the way it used to work is with wood craftsmen, is that the wood that you work with would be the wood that was put down one, two generations before you in terms of your craftspeople that came yeah. before you. Because if you think about it, these are you know trees that take 80 years or whatever to mature. Yeah. If you're going to do that sustainably, you've got to have a line where you're planting and a succession that's going to... Uh -huh last 80 years till they get cut down again and there's enough of them going around and that's how it used to work you used to cut the wood and lay it down for the others to come but now it's all it's mine because it, i use it yeah. you throw it away and you've got to be careful how you use that word sustainability because just because there is plentiful supplies of it now that's not sustainable because in 10 15 20 years you may have taken it as rare as brazilian rosewood yeah. if you're not actually planting and maintaining and cutting in a way that means you're maintaining the stock and th there's sort of an immediacy to the, our current society that doesn't have that sort of strategic thinking that you're actually doing something that's not going to benefit you per se but it's yeah. going to benefit the craft that you believe in long after you're gone yeah. you know people if you do that some people sort of look at you saying what are you doing that for yeah well, what's in it for you well you're preserving that tradition yeah. And the line for people to come to actually use that wood and then things become sustainable if you put enough thought and effort into doing it i think people are waking up to it i think the yeah. world in general is beginning to wake up to the the top heavy structure that we have in yeah. the capitalist world and things will come back the, yeah i'm rambling here so yeah this is what you get with an interview with me but there's yeah you know, the thing about the tropical rainforest that people are saying we've depleted now uh and it's all our fault that they've gone there's been a few interesting programs about um, the original conquistadors that went down the Amazon. And there's one of them, I forget his name now, but he went furthest down and he gave reports back to Spain about these massive cities he found with big sort of square palatial layouts of streets and houses and the rest of it. And they all yeah. thought he was either on the drugs or malaria or something and they didn't believe him. And they've now started doing aerial surveys and some clearing out where stuff has been taken down in the middle of the Amazon rainforest. And do you know what they found? Tell me. Massive cities with streets and the rest of it, where the forest had been cleared by civilizations before. Right. So a lot of the Brazilian rainforests that have come up has been, if you think about it, 1500s onwards. So when you say we destroy it, you know, if you give it another, what we, Four five hundred years, mm -hmm. it'll be back because that forest right. grew on top of these yeah. big cities that have been cleared originally to be built by these original civilizations. So there's there's an awful lot of um, what I say bad academic research that goes on about people that don't look far enough back yeah. or think far enough forward about what's going to happen to these timbers. So you know there could be rainforests of Brazilian rosewood growing again, being harvested using for guitars. Huh. Give it two hundred years, give it three hundred years, you, you can have it. Yeah. This question is how much do you want it or how much does the world want it? So the way out of that is to actually give countries like Brazil sustainable industries so they can survive rather than having to cut all this stuff down for nothing just to yeah. live hand to mouth yeah. in the interim. So 
And the same is true with spruce, because that, you know, a post um, Burwell Berlin Wall coming down, there used to be pristine forests of uh, European spruce in Carpathia and the, the Baltic states and the rest yeah. of it. An awful lot of that has been levelled post the wall coming down and uh, capitalism working its way into those frontiers. Yeah. And sadly, a lot of it's probably going for stuff like toilet paper and the rest of it, as opposed to magical musical <laughs> instruments. Sad. Yeah, it's really sad, Because yeah. Yeah. do you remember Mario Pru? Yeah, I've met him. Yeah, yeah, because he always used to bemoan the fact over in Canada, all the big swathes of Sitka, nearly all of the big old trees of that went into the toilet rolls as opposed to massive and great <laughs> American, North American guitar. So it's, if you think of it that way, it's, it's sad, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's tragic. <laughs> tragic. So what's next on your, your drawing? Oh, who knows? I don't know. I've got very short attention. I've just done an acoustic bass, which was interesting, which seems to be going down well here. Uh, I have this competition with Colin Simmons that one of us at some stage is going to make hurdy-gurdy because those are quite hard. So that might be on, but I don't know. I just take things as orders come in or as I fancy making things. I'll go off and see where I can take my skill and see what I can make happen. Mm. I've done most things though now, I think. So I've done, done banjos, done weird banjos. I've done ukuleles, done harp guitars, harp ukuleles. Uh, done some of the Carla fretless bass ukuleles which are a huge amount of fun uh, I've done lap slides acoustic lap slides baritone lap slides acoustic bass guitar so I'm slightly running out of ideas but I'll think of something don't worry and you have a quattro oh, the quattro well that's just basically um, a baritone ukulele but you the re-entrant tuning is done low to low rather than high to high do you want something about the re-entrant yeah it's like on the banjo like uh, not Oh. sort of yeah that's right yeah and same as you but the idea is as i understand it the reason it's called re-entrant is that a lot of i think a lot of these instruments came from the portuguese when they came across with the portuguese style, style guitar because the portuguese went to uh, hawaii didn't they and did that and i think that mutated itself into the ukes that came out oh, of there okay. and they also went around the caribbean so if you look in uh, trinidad's got a lot of them and you've got the uh, venezuelan style and there's another south america because one of them is the one that's carved out like an armadillo and there's the other one that's like the ukulele style but they came from those portuguese multicoursed because you can still get the tarapatch ukes which are the paired up strings right. in fours but basically the re-entrant means because a lot of it's played percussively with the fast strumming yeah. is that you go in and you come out pretty much on the same note okay. so if you think about the the normal uke with the high top string if you fret that second fret, it's the same note as your first string. So you basically, if you hold that fret, yeah. you come in and out on the same note. Oh. The quattro is the same. It's like you have the low one on the low, but you replace it with a, a lower string on the first string. Yeah. So although it's tuned a semitone higher than a normal uke, it sounds way deeper because you come out and in on that low note. Whereas on you, you come out and in on that high note, and that's what the brain in. Ah, okay. But it's called re-entrant because you go in that's and come out on pretty much the same note. Yeah. Fascinating. Whereas the banjo isn't quite. Well, the banjo almost is, isn't it? Because you've got it's the high, high fifth, fifth yeah. but it, you can't quite cap. You'd have to cap out your first string, wouldn't you? Up to the fifth fret, yeah. and then you get a re-entrant in and out sound. Yeah. But yeah, there's nothing new. We all think <laughs> we invent these brand new. If you go back far enough, you'll find someone in the 13, 1400s that's made something similar yeah. using the technology they had then. So it's yeah, it's good. Have you ever built a bazooka? Oh, loads, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I forgot those, didn't I? Do, I do, my favourites are the guitar bazookas because I like the more air you get in the um, the uh, guitar body size. But I have done the, what people call the Irish or the flatback yeah. bazookas, yeah. mandolins. It's difficult to know what to call them because um, people call this, because Stefan did this sit thing where he called it that because it reminded him of the Portuguese guitar. Is that with Saturna. Well, that's where I quibble with it. You see, uh, that because he called it a sitan, and they had some of them had five courses. People tend to think it's a sitan if it's got five courses, but that's what I thought. they're basically multi-course, aren't they? Because if you stick another set onto a guitar bazooki, it doesn't turn it into a sitan. It just becomes right. a five-course guitar bazooki because okay. it depends what tuning you're going to play it in, what scale you're going to do yeah. it. Are you going to have it in octaves? Are you going to have it in unisons? So I, I regard them all as multi-course instruments. Probably I call them and. The because you know people are going to use debates over what constitutes an octave mandolin. Yeah. Depending if you're in America or if you're in yeah. Europe, they'd mean different things. But they're mm -hmm. slightly smaller scale length, four course 
instruments generally, although you can have five chords on that smaller thing, put yeah. another course on it. So yeah. Menkelish, I don't want to get into. Give them names like Treebeard, <laughs> Nanfoquil and the rest of it. You yeah. start calling them and yeah. octave mandolins and the rest, I get very confused. So what was your fascination with the Gaelic? Does that come from? The Gaelic, yeah, it's an odd thing. Um, I've always liked Celtic music, let's put it that way. Um, I went to various Martin Simpson workshops where obviously he's got influence that comes from the Celtic stuff. And then in the early 2000s, uh, I had the opportunity to go and work over in Dublin for two years. I mm -hmm. actually commuted over, went to, flew out on the Monday morning, came back Friday evening. But I was out there during the week in Dublin at the time of the Celtic Tigger Boom. Uh, so I got to go to a place called The Shelter in Dublin, where a lot of the uh, Celtic acts were playing. The people like Mike McGoldrick were playing there oh, and okay. John McSherry and Andy Irving played and all of the yeah. upcoming Irish groups and the rest of it. So yeah. I was really into that, that side of it. And a good friend of mine uh, has a house out in Donegal, Burtonport. So he's of Irish stock and he was out there in Dublin at the same time. And I was, my aim was to get early retirement, which is what I got, which would give me the scope to go and make instruments so I was asking him about names and I was thinking white guitars didn't sound very good Dave white guitars didn't sound very good so there was a quiz night in the uh, Dunleary Yacht Club I think it was that he took me to and him and his cousin were eminent uh, Gaelic scholars so I said to him if I wanted to be called uh, Dave White in Gaelic what would it be and he went away and then he wrote me this little thing it said Dr. Tweecher which oh. sounds way better than Dave White guitars so that's where the twitch came from and everyone gets confused but i think it's the norman isn't it it's the french influence because the, the normans went over and conquered ireland when they did uh england 1066 they went to ireland next and they did it there yeah. so i think it's the norman the de which is obviously french but the other one is ban so yeah docky ban just sounds weird <laughs> <laughs> so docky de Fuitre is my alter ego when i make uh instruments and i always sign the tops that's signed and dated as Docky Twitcher right. on the inside of the top. So yeah, well, it has a nice ring to it. Yeah, it does. But it's... It when you see it written and you've no idea what how to that? pronounce it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's the Fwa Twitcher, the Twitcher, Twitcher, Yeah. So Gaelic is kind of on the rise in Scotland again. Yeah, yeah. On the Calmac ferry where we cross from Arran to Drossen, they have the ferry announcements in two languages. And the supermarket has Gaelic in there. Yeah, and they're teaching it more in yeah, schools, aren't they? Cause not on Aran, no? no. I know they are in some of the other islands, but in Aran, not yet. Not yet. It's more of a marketing thing, I think. Than oh, else. right. You get tourists in. The tourists go away and they hear it and they think, oh. oh. Yeah, <laughs> so I think that's a large part of Calmax thinking. It's yeah, but it's, it's certainly there in the um, the upsurge of Scottish music that's coming through in things like Celtic Connections, isn't it? There's a lot of Gaelic singing goes yeah, on there, there is, with the rest of it. So is. that gives me the impression that it's still surviving and thriving yeah. as a culture and language. And there's something really, rem even though you don't know what someone is singing in that language it, it's just got that feel hasn't it that stuff yeah. that sets the hairs on the back of your yeah. neck we did have i think we had two gaelic songs in our Cayley band set our harp player could sing in gaelic so we had a couple of songs yeah and when you hear uh, someone like uh, karen casey or um what's his name oh leonard the one that sings with africa else but he's a shane Noss singer because i heard him in a small that small shelter club singing shane Noss. right okay. uh, it's just the most magical thing and i didn't realize actually until my friend mark thompson told me that the whole pibrock thing mm -hmm. that was meant to be a piper and a singer gaelic singer the whole yeah. pibrock thing was them doing different variations around a song so you get oh, the, vo the voice doing that. the song and then the pipe doing the, the song and the variations was oh. a your proper pibrocks is a the right. Gaelic singing and the, the piping together. Huh. So, yeah, I'd, I'd yeah. find that fascinating because that. I've learned something. Yeah. I think it's true. You might find it sort of rubbish, yeah. but Mark told me, so I'm, right. I'm convinced it must be right because he knows his well, Scottish Mark heritage stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Fascinating. Well, Dave, thank you very much for sitting with me. This thank morning. you, Cam. It's been fascinating talking to you and I hope the listeners enjoy listening. If people want to look you up, could you direct them to your, your presence? Yeah, online? it's www defuitcheguitars.com d-e-f-a-o-i-t-e guitars.com 
Great. But I'm sure you can stick that on the end of your credit thing. I will. That'll be uh, in the show notes. Yep. It inked it, yeah. Okay. But Thank you, you there's lots of stuff on there because I, I, my website is as long and babbly as I am here. So there's lots of <laughs> lots of bill documented. So if people are interested to see how insurance get made, there's lots of things where you can look through photo documentaries and stuff. I put lots of recordings up because yes, I play as well of instruments. So you can, you can wallow your way through that and listen mm. to a lot of stuff. And I've written a few articles for people and luthiers that are sort of interested in the process and my views on building. So please feel free to browse around and enjoy yourself and get in contact. Great. Thank you very much. Dave. Thanks, Ken. Mm.